As we've seen with C Molesto, we can build a piece of music going from a chord progression. And that can be a common chord progression that we find online, one we make up, one that's specific for a genre. Or, of course, we can start with any layer of music. We might start with rhythm, we might start with a phrase of melody. Which is what happened the second time I tried to write a tango. So, we ended up being locked down for around nine months. And I could tell right from the outset that it wasn't going to be the two weeks that were promised. Uh, I could see all the glaring contradictions in the narrative and the damage that was being done in the name of protecting us. And whilst I hadn't and haven't decided on my own theory about what was going on or what is going on, I was sure pretty soon that I didn't believe in the official narrative. I was angry that anyone with an opinion like mine was being accused of short-sightedness or misanthropy, where I felt I was doing my job as a citizen, which was to question things that needed questioning. I have to admit, this was a very dark time for me and I'm not over it yet. It was traumatizing because all I could think about were the precedents that were being set and where this could all lead. Sometimes, when your head is awash with discourse, the best way to express it isn't with words, but with music, especially when words are censored. And so all of this frustration, anger and desperation, and ultimately resistance, would be channeled into El Comienzo de los Fines, which means... The beginning of the end. The beginning of the ends. So this title is a comment on precedence. We have accepted the precedent of suspending all rights and everything that holds our society together, everything that helps us believe in the society we participate in every day. And so I felt some resistance, and I sat with the instrument with those feelings. Now, when you're familiar with an instrument, you can try just translating feeling into physical movement, trusting your fingers to make that translation without you even having to think about the music. No, like you can bypass that, almost something like direct subconscious to the instrument. It's worth trying that. And, and that's what I did here. I, I had this very strong feeling and I sat down and So my fingers came out with this melodic theme, but the chords that reply I heard those in my head and I had to work out what chords they were with an informed fiddling around on the instrument, thinking with theory what is the most likely chords we'd have with these notes in the melody in this key, but still searching for what we're hearing in our minds. So, the first thing we have is this theme. Now the rest of the melody is just variations on that, giving some context, giving some complicated under or overtones of what we feel. No, but the main feeling is this, and what do you interpret from that? Everything's held together, all strong and together. Yeah, it's forceful and organised as an argument, no? Maybe it's the clarity coming together, maybe it's people coming together. So it's tight, forceful. In your face? A little bit in your face. So this is all kind of like uh, exploding in a musical self-affirmation. So we have that, that strong melodic phrase. The rest of the melody, it might come out naturally, no, we might have that in us, we might hear it in our head, it might just come out of our fingers. Or we can look at the little bit of melody that we have found, no. And make variations on that using theory, what we know about theory, to flesh out the melody. Most of the time it ends up being a mixture of the two, and however it happens, it doesn't matter, there's no more or less musical way. As long as your ear is the final judge, you're channeling your musicality. So, this came out and I had to have a look. Oh, okay, what, what's going on? What, what key am I in? I have to look, what, what are my fingers doing? I'm playing F, 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 G, A flat, A flat, G, F, G, A flat. So we have F, G, and A flat. Now, having all those notes so close together, we can suspect one is a passing note. What one would you suspect out of F, G, and A flat? G. G. No, because from F to A we skip a letter, so that's likely to form some kind of harmonic sense. No. So F to A flat, what chord does that look like? F minor. F minor, with a G passing note. Now this 
lasts a measure and a half. Is the first measure, and then the second measure is. And then we get the chord replying, responding. So this is interesting. We have a weird conspiration between the melody and the harmony because the harmony kind of takes some sort of melodic protagonism when it responds. It's very definitely a response because we don't have any harmony until that. There's nothing going on harmonically. No, we just have this melody by itself. And then the response. Now, as a phrasing decision, and often some decisions of phrasing like this are not written in music, I'm playing the next F, which begins the repetition of that theme, quite close to this, as if it was a continuation of it. And these kind of finer decisions, of course, they might occur to you straight away with the theme, or they might come after playing it for a while, where you want to make it a little bit more interesting. Here, for me, that it was the latter. So. Did you notice that? And then there's a little bit more space before I play the next note, because when you do things like that, you rob time in music. You have to pay it back somewhere else. So what might those chords be? The first chord we play C, E and B flat. What chord might that be? C, E and B flat. E minor. E minor? Why E minor? What two notes can you put in an order there, jumping a note, if we have C, E and B flat? Well, I'm jumping. Uh, C and E. C and E. So the most probable thing, the most probable thing is that we have some type of C chord. Uh -huh. No? Then look at what the B flat might be doing. C7? Yeah, it's a C7 chord, which in this context is the dominant 7. So what key are we in? If the C7 is the dominant 7, what is C a dominant of? F. F, F minor. We know it's F minor because it sounds minor. <laughs> we have the A flat, yeah. which F to A flat is a minor third. No, so the first harmonic interpretation, even though we have no chord going on when we play, we can say that that measure is an F minor. Looking at those notes as a collective, that measure is an F minor, even though we have nothing played in the harmony. So that's the tonic chord split into a melody. Melody meaning old of the limbs or parts. These are the limbs of the chord. So that's the tonic chord. And then we respond with the dominant seventh, which is like the dominant, only more tense. What makes it more tense? Why would the dominant seventh be more tense than the dominant? So you have to look at the only thing that's different between C major and C7, which is the extra note C7 has, no? So what is that note? B flat. When we add a B flat to the mix, what is happening inside of that chord? What do we have between E and B flat? A diminished fifth. A diminished fifth. So the dominant seven, which is a very common chord, you will find it around, adds more tension than the dominant chord. Because it's like the dominant chord with an extra diminished fifth thrown in for good measure. No? Super unstable, very begging for resolution. <laughs> And then here on the second repetition, we have a different chord. <laughs> replying to the theme again, but also replying to the first chord. <laughs> we have A, C and E flat, which looks like an A diminished chord. But that would be a weird chord to have in F minor, seeing that F minor has an A flat rather than an A. It's not impossible, but we should look for a more fitting explanation. So what other chord might this be apart from A diminished? We should try to think about what note might be missing here. A, C and E flat. When we do that, we shouldn't forget that the root note, the note the chord is named after, might also be missing. F. F. So this is not an A diminished chord, although it does look like one. It's in fact 
an F7 or tonic 7 chord just with the root note missing. We have the major third, A natural, the perfect fifth, C, and then the flat seventh, E flat, giving us F7 with F missing. So even with the root note missing of the chord, we still understand that it's an F chord rather than an A chord, an A diminished chord, in the context of the key, because we can imagine, our brains imagine the missing root note to make sense of that chord in the context of this music. So this is a tonic seventh chord. So the first response was a dominant seventh. And then we reply with the tonic seventh, which offers some resolution, but not much. It's a tonic chord, but it is, of course, missing the tonic note. Tonic chords generally aim to resolve the argument of the dominant, but this chord can't fully. It has some not very tonic-y stuff going on. Not only is it missing the tonic note, it also contains the diminished fifth between the notes A and D flat. The dominant seven chord presents a contradiction in its argument with its diminished fifth. Almost, look, this is the problem. And the tonic chord aims to resolve that or dismiss it, but contradicts itself in the process, replying with another diminished fifth. This argument, or chord, without a foundation, begs an elaboration of the melody. So after the repetitions of the theme, then we get variations of the theme. To do that, you can just look at the, the melody you have already and invert it, double some notes, half other notes, just any kind of simple math that might occur to you. Now you might, I might turn this two quarter notes into a half note, or this half note into two quarter notes. Going, okay, what happens here if I use the median instead of the submedian? What happens there if I use what will look more like the second tonic than the first tonic? What happens there if I take that strong note off the strong beat? Simple things like that. Just thinking about, in a playful way, stuff that we now know how to think about. So doing that, and always thinking about the feeling I wanted to communicate, I played around and soon found the rough theme, which I'd continue, and may still continue, to edit, to alter. So this is the whole theme without the chords, well, with just the important initial chords. Now this, I actually orchestrated it for, for tango orchestra, Orquesta Tipica, which is strings, so cello, violin, viola, double bass, piano and bandoneons. So you can start with a melody like this, and if you're setting it for, to more than one instrument, you're just deciding what instruments take which parts where and why. And the main reasoning behind that will be tone color, timbre, how each instrument sounds. Of course, if we play an A at 440 hertz on the piano and the bandoneon and the violin, it all sounds different. That's timbre. The reason for that is because when we play a note and it reproduces its overtones, it doesn't reproduce all of the overtones in the same way. And the specific pattern of how the overtones sound is what gives different instruments their characteristic sounds, or even each individual instrument, each individual violin or piano, and also the human voice, its unique tone, the fingerprint of its tone. Maybe this is why we say person, per sound. Each person has a unique fingerprint, we know, but we probably notice that long after noticing that we all have unique voices. So this audible fingerprint is timbre or tone color. It's what makes wood and string sound like wood and string. It's what makes brass sound like brass. When choosing wood to create violins with, some violin makers might choose wood that has fought and suffered against the wind or against altitude. This tension captured in the wood is externalized in the timbre of the violin. Within the timbre, we have all the elements of music as well. Within the pattern of overtones of any individual instrument or voice, we can find melodies, beats, chords. This is why people pay thousands or millions for handcrafted violins especially old ones in which the wood has absorbed many musical lives. 
lives and time which affects the timbre of the violin. Or why singers with unique timbres dominate the globe, often no matter what they sing. It seems there is little as valuable in our world as a rich, uniquely beautiful timbre. Each timbre already tells a story. The story of the violin has entered our cultural references, no? We say when someone's feeling sorry for themselves, for example, we make comments about playing the world's smallest violin. Even though the violin or fiddle can play happy music, there's already a story of struggle in the violin's timbre. And just playing one note, even before they play any music, there are already feelings involved. There's already a story. This means a violin, a piano, a person already sings a song as soon as they vibrate. And we are always vibrating, albeit inaudibly. So these are our considerations when we're orchestrating, deciding which part of the music goes with which instrument and why. There's no right way to think about that in the same way that there's no right way to think about the rest of the music we've looked at. The point is thinking coherently. If we think coherently, our music is likely to be coherent. So I can share some of my thoughts orchestrating El Comienzo de los Fines. So I kind of felt like I needed an army for this. It wasn't something I wanted to be singing in a corner by myself, no. It's a forceful piece of music. So the Orquesta Tipica, the tango orchestra, really did feel perfect for this. So I won't analyze this too much because it's very much a working process and might even contain a mistake or two, but we can focus on the timbre decisions. So this set to orchestra, I decided to open with the bandoneons. The timbre of the bandoneon is not far from that of a car horn, it raises the alarm. And then the violins respond with pizzicato, which is just Italian for plucking. I have it on the computer. This sounds, ter this sounds terrible because it's on the program, but here goes. So that was the pizzicato responding to the initial theme. Responding with plucks and plucks in silence, there's no other instruments playing, no, has the same effect as beginning with the alarming bandoneons, no, just in a different way. It makes you listen up. The sound of the plucked violins puts more question marks over what's happening. It's a strange thing to happen and adds to the tension of the dominant seven the violins are playing together. And whilst it's not so clear on, on this music program, what's coming now is the violins taking the first repetition of the theme. And then the bandoneons reply with the chord. And then all the instruments come in together there, no? Like, like an army of reason or something. This gives us um, the collective timbre of the Orquesta Tipica. Until now, we've had a timbre in the spotlight. But now we get the overall unified sound of the Orquesta Tipica in force. We can really feel the strong marcato thumping out on the piano no, marking each beat. The timbre of the piano is especially great for this. It's thick growling timbre in the lower ranges. And we really take advantage of the timbre or timbres of the violin in this piece because apart from pizzicato, plucking, we also play a few of what we call harmonics. This is a trick you can do with stringed instruments to play harmonics over tones of the instruments without playing a fundamental note. So if you hover your finger above a string without pressing down on it, on a violin for example, in certain places on the string, you can literally play over tones. These sound eerie and unnatural and arguably achieve something similar to chords that are missing their root notes like that F7. And this is that same F7 chord we're hearing now, by the way. Only now it isn't missing the F, but we're playing the notes of the chord as these strange hollow harmonics, not reproduced very well by the computer program, by the way. I chose the violin for the solo because I like the contrast between a kind of reasoned zero hysterical solo, the solo is nowhere near as dramatic as it could be or, or even as you might expect it to be considering the nature of the music and the solo instrument in question, 
So it's like, look, we even got the violin being sober and sensible. We're not mucking around. And after this solo melody, we go back into the same theme, which is dividing itself amongst the instruments in a way that highlights their union, thick as thieves. When one instrument falters, the other enters, and then the faltering instrument quickly falls back into rank and supports the charge. All of this creates contours of tension. And this is what all art does. It's what life does, if we think about it. In fact, if life doesn't do this, we're likely to become depressed. Or if life does this too much, we're likely to become very stressed or anxious. If you look at a painting, which is just a faithful representation of a house, let's say, the more faithful that representation is to reality, the more boring it's likely to be, at least in most circumstances. The beauty in that painting is unexpected things. Maybe one line of the house is missing, no? which causes some tension and release in regards to your expectations when you're looking at that painting. And the missing line outlining the house shouldn't be missing, but the fact that it is touches a chord, so to speak. The same goes for narrative, storytelling, jokes. The same goes for fashion. These means of communication are intuitive, apart from all the theory. If I asked you now to communicate danger or peace with a dance, you would do that intuitively. And the musical system is no less intuitive. However you project this understanding onto and into your musical journey will define your musical character. And so you should analyse everything artistic in a musical way. Maybe attributing major, minor or diminished feelings to certain parts of a building, to a comedy sketch or a painting. All of this will deepen your musical understanding, and musical understanding is an understanding of everything. Music is just maybe the most intangible manifestation of the creative forces that generate everything, including ourselves. Thank you for taking this course. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, the point of this course is to show how the thinking method may apply to other areas, and I will now be creating a platform languagetransfer.org forward slash platform for anybody that wants to attempt writing material uh, with this method uh, so I can help them do that please check out that link languagetransfer.org forward slash platform and and share this idea if you know a great teacher maybe they want to make a course with the thinking method www.languagetransfer.org forward slash platform for those of you interested in course writing or forward slash support for those that might want to support this project. Thanks for being here and I really hope this course has helped you enjoy and create music.